This is a lecture on urinalysis. First of all, the thing we're talking about here is azotemia. This is a medical condition characterized by abnormally high levels of nitrogen containing compounds such as urea, creatinine, various body waste compounds, and other nitrogen rich compounds in the blood. There are three types of azotemia prerenal, postrenal, and intrarenal. Pretty descriptive here. Um, basically, things before your kidney, uh, things after your kidney, and um, things in your kidney. So, here's a kidney like this. This would be uh, this would be pre. This would be post. And this would be intra. Now, when you're gonna approach this, um, you think you're thinking prerenal azotemia if the person has decreased cardiac output. So the amount of blood coming out of their heart is decreased, or they have decreased intravascular volume, basically meaning that uh, inside their vasculature they have less volume, so maybe they're, they bled out or something, or if they have decreased intrinsic autoregulation of the kidney. In other words, um, their kidney is um, intrinsically not regulating itself or is not being regulated properly. This can happen with things like, for example, apparently if you take too many NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, this can be associated with nephritis or it can even mess up your prostaglandins which can uh, mess up some of this autoregulation, intrinsic autoregulation of the kidney. So then you're thinking now uh, post-renal azotemia. So in post renal azotemia, you're thinking, so here's your kidney. So you already kind of ruled out this one. Things that can, you know, determine the kidney, such as you don't have enough blood going to it, you know, things like that. And and we're we haven't talked about what's going on in it yet. So now we're thinking on this end. This is post renal, okay? And uh, in this case, usually it's just an obstruction. I mean, there's something in here, and uh, you know, the pee isn't able to get out. And in this case, normally what happens is you can just detect this with an ultrasound. So you just put a little Doppler ultrasound on th thing on here. And then you can just treat it with a catheter. So that'll fix the problem, putting a catheter in there. Okay, so what about intrarenal? So this is inside of the kidney, okay? Now you only think intrarenal if you've already ruled out, the, you know, did they have... Um, did they have, you know, maybe not enough blood or was there some other, you know, issue going on, didn't have high cardiac output, whatever. Um, you've already ruled out whether it's a blockage. So you've got rid of the pre and you've got rid of the idea of the post. And now you're thinking, what about inside of this thing? So in this case, maybe it's a disease of the glomeruli. So let's talk about some of these diseases of the gl uh, glomeruli. So when discussing this, you're going to start talking about urinalysis. In other words, you're going to take a sample of pee and you're going to examine this pee and you're going to see if there's any abnormalities. But some abnormalities that you can see are things like hematuria. That's where you see the blood in the pee. Okay? Now there's kind of two ways this can manifest. One is going to be you can see red pee. Okay? If you see actual like red pee, most likely um, like it's like a gross appearance of pee, uh, that's quite a bit of, of blood. And uh, if you can actually see the blood in there, it's probably happening happening pretty pretty far down, uh, like after the kidneys or something. Okay, um, but yeah, that kind of just is intuitive. So one thing you can look for that's extremely important is something called red cell casts. Now what this is, remember inside of your you know tubules and everything inside your kidney, you've got all these little you know loops and whatnot. And sometimes some red blood cells can kind of get stuck in here. And they'll get stuck in here for a while. And then the fluid will come along and wash them through. And they'll go through and they'll end up coming out in your pee. And you'll get this appearance of these like red blood cells that are kind of casted like this. And uh, that is blood from those glomerular tubes. And it comes out very indicative of glomerular disease. Sometimes you can also get protein in your pee. And I'll talk about that more later, at least I plan to. 
the issue here is that if it's like albumin, then you're thinking that you know maybe this uh, there's supposed to be this kind of basement membrane that kind of uh, kind of prevents the too much stuff from washing through here. And if it get and if this basement membrane gets messed up, then you get big chunks of stuff, big chunks of protein like albumin that go into your uh, tubes and whatnot, and those albumin chunks go through and they get washed out down here. Um, one of the important markers is the albumin creatinine ratio. I'm not going to discuss that too much in this. That's an, a le later lecture. Another thing you can get in your pee is glycosuria. Okay, this basically just mean this means uh, it's like sugar in your pee, and uh, this is uh, common in people with diabetes or people with Fancon Fanconi syndrome syndrome. And you're looking for somewhere between 180 to 200 milligrams per deciliter. So if you see 180 to 200 milligrams per deciliter, I guess that's that's a big deal. Next is ketone urea. These are fat metabolites in your pee, and that's bad. Uh, you see this in people on the Atkins diet or people that are starving, because it's kind of the same thing. Or even sometimes people on uncontrolled diabetes. Uh, it's like your body's breaking down your ketones, and it's coming out in your pee. Um, also, you can get nitrates. Apparently, you do have some form of nitrates in your urine normally, but they're kind of like more complex structures. And you can get bacteria that will kind of break these apart and release like these free nitrates. And if you get those free nitrates, that's kind of indicative of bacteria in your pee. Another one is leukocyte esterase. So leukocyte esterase is going to be something that's produced by neutrophils. So if you've got neutrophils up here in your kidneys... These neutrophils are going to apparently produce leukocyte esterase, okay? Um, you know, esterase enzyme associated with ester. And uh, if you got that, you're thinking, man, there's there's some kind of something wrong up there. If neutrophils are coming there. Maybe they have chlamydia, especially if you see it's not growing in a culture, like if you get a negative culture, or maybe it's a tumor, or maybe there's like some sort of obstruction or something like that. Um yeah, it can be quite a few things. Next, um, bilirubin or urobilinogen. Bil if you see those things, you're thinking liver dysfunction or biliary obstruction. One of those two things, okay? Those things come out in your urine. Next, dimorphic erythrocytes. Basically what this is is an erythrocyte that's all like squeezed all weird. Apparently that is indicative also of glomerular disease. Okay, a little more on hematuria. So... In the case of hematuria, remember this was the thing we discussed earlier. This is where you got blood in your pee. So in the case of hematuria, you're, you're looking at, you know, you get a little uh, sample of pee and you spin it and you look at it under a high power field. And if you see like two to four red blood cells in there, you know, then you're thinking, okay, this person's got hematuria. But be aware that if a person has myoglobinuria or rhabdomyolysis, this can indicate a false positive. In other words, it's, they don't really have... Uh, hematuria, but it, I don't know, it's not, it's not the same, I guess. They, they don't really have uh, uh, intrarenal disease, it's something else. Okay, hematuria without progenuria or red blood cell casts, you're thinking this must be a urinary tract problem, like below the kidney. So here's the kidney, like this, and if, and if you look at the person's pee, and you see, okay, they've got red blood cells, but there's no protein, Okay, where did the, why did the protein come in there? The protein came because here was that, that basement membrane, remember? And if, the, if this is damaged, then protein crosses this basement membrane. And you get those like albumin or whatnot in your pee. Okay, but you, if you get no protein, but there is red blood cells, no protein, and there's no red blood cell casts, then you're like, whoa, this problem must be like after all this stuff, like, like after the kidneys. So this is more like a urinary tract problem, below the kidney. If your pee is literally just red, like you've got blood coming out of your, yeah, uh, you're thinking this is like below the ureter. This is like way down low. I'm not going to draw it, but yeah. Um, you define persistent as there being, I think that's supposed to be more, more than three episodes, and um, or it can be, uh, more than a hundred red blood cells. And in this case, you're thinking it's a pathology. 90% of the time means there's a pathology. If you've got three episodes or hundred red blood cells. Uh, the other thing we're looking for here, this isn't technically hematuria, but it's, it's pyuria. Pyuria, I don't know why it's called pyuria, but basically this is 
white blood cells in your pee. And if you see that, you're thinking some kind of infection because you know white blood cells come towards infections. Okay, now if you got stuff in your pee, um, these are a bunch of pictures kind of describing a lot of different situations. Um, first of all, if you look at your pee and it looks cloudy, you're thinking, ah, oh, it must be phosphate crystals um, in alkaline urine. Or it could be cloudy because there's white blood cells in it, kind of the white looking appearance. If you see colorless rectangles, colorless, colorless rectangles, let's see, do I see any colorless rectangles anywhere on this thing? Uh, you're thinking uh, Proteus. Oh, here we go. So down here, if you look at, hold on here, I just saw it a second ago. Triple phosphate C. This picture. Oh yeah, yeah. Obviously, there's a rectangle. Doesn't really have any color to it. There's another rectangle. What are you thinking? Um, you're thinking triple phosphate. You're thinking. Um, I guess Proteus, <laughs> the thing said, whatever. Um, hexagons. Oh, here's some hexagons. Look at that. Six-sided things. What are you thinking with that? You're thinking cystinuria. Uh, what about this one up here? Uh, this one says uh, urinary crystals, calcium oxalate. So apparently that's what calcium oxalate looks like. That's cool. Uh, then this one down here, B, this is uric acid. So if you see something like this, you're thinking uric acid. Uric acid, calcium oxalate, this one was the triple phosphate, the amorphous phosphates, and this here was the cysteine. Okay, coming over to this one. Um, this is, remember I was talking about the red blood cell casts? See all the red blood cells and they're kind of cast in the shape of the, the thing there? That's what that looks like. Um, so this, there's different kinds of casts, though, and we'll go over this a little bit later. This is a hyaline cast. Okay, so this is basically a bunch of um, uh, hyaline that's been kind of stuck in there. Uh, this picture here, this is an erythrocyte ca cast. This is a leukocyte cast. That's a bunch of white blood cells, pyuria. And this is a granular cast. This is like a, um, before scar formation, I, I believe, granular tissue. Okay, so now going on to the dipstick urinalysis. This is a little bit more complicated, but basically I'll just kind of go over this. Um, you got less than 250 uh, urine milliosmoles per liter, I think in primary polydipsia. You got greater than two, 300 um, milliosmoles, you're thinking solute diuresis. Uh, if you check the specific uh, gravity, and it's 1.01, .01, or it's iso... Thenuric. I don't remember what these things mean. <laughs> I don't know. I guess that's if it's this, then it's isothenuric. Okay, we'll look that up again later. Uh, specific gravity, normal. Um, that's normal. Okay, so what is that? 1.003 to 1.93. Okay, so that's normal for specific gravity. But uh, also, if you're looking at it and it's 1.01, .01, you're thinking, oh, this person must be hydrated, have enough water. But if you see that it's greater than 1.02, then you're thinking, oh, they're dehydrated. And um, looking at the pH is important. Um, apparently, there's some little bacteria guys that can um, split urea. And if urea is split, I guess urea is acidic. And when it's split, it's not acidic anymore. So that's going to increase the pH, making it um, you know, less acidic. So if you, if you have this kind of alkaline urine, um, then you think that maybe this person has a ure, urea splitting organism. That kind of help you like narrow down your diagnosis. So you're thinking pH of 8. Um, so if you have alkyl, alkaline urine and the person has a, a UTI, urea splitting organism. If the person has a pH greater than 5.5, you're thinking possible renal tubular acidosis. Okay, there's two types of, of renal tubular acidosis. Type 1, this is in the distal part of the renal system. Uh, and in this case, you're thinking acidic oh, acidic serum, but out, so that your blood is acidic, but your, your pee is alkaline. And this is because you have an inability to secrete protons in the urine. In other words, your protons can't go into your pee, Okay, and so your pee is alkaline. 
but your serum, your blood, is acidic. Type 2, this is more proximal, you have the same thing. You have acidic serum, so your blood is, is acidic, your pee is alkaline, but this isn't because of an inability to secrete protons in your urine. This is because of an inability to reabsorb bicarbonate. That's different. Type 2, you can't reabsorb car bicarbonate. Type 1, you can't secrete protons in your urine. Okay, red blood cell cast. So basically, this is pretty much pathognomonic, whatever. Glomerulonephritis means red blood cell casts, which if you go back up here, these are red blood cell casts. So if you see those red blood cell casts, and you also have protein excretion greater than 500 mil, uh, five, that, then the person has glomerulonephritis. All right, lastly on here, smelling the pee. Apparently you can smell pee and you can even get ideas of what's going on. So if the person's pee smells really strong like pee, they're probably dehydrated. It's just really concentrated urine, okay? Uh, if you smell it, it smells kind of like fruity or sort of sweet smelling. You're thinking, oh, got some sugar in there, diabetic ketoacidosis. If you smell it and it smells like ammonia, well, this is probably from alkaline fermentation. So this, is, this happens after like holding your pee for a long time, long bladder retention. If you smell it and it has this kind of pungent smelling, strong sort of smell, maybe it's a bladder infection. Could also be, could also be that too. Um, but if it, if you if uh, if it's sulfuric smelling urine, like smells like sulfur, you're thinking gastrointestinal bladder fistula. I think that means that basically your poo and pee are like mixing with each other. I don't really know what that means, but that's what it said. All right, and that concludes that presentation. So now I'm going to pull up this document here, talk through a little bit. This is going in a little bit more depth than the other one went through. Um, the other one was just kind of a basic introduction to this. Um, I'm not going to read through all this, but hopefully some of this will help a little bit. Okay, first of all, azotemia. Now back in the day, apparently they had a different ways of kind of measuring azotemia. There's like markers or methods to, de to kind of detect this. Um, this one right here, inulin, is, um, is measuring it directly. Uh, in fact, I'm going to use my mouse thing so you can kind of see what I'm, what I'm doing here. Um, inulin is measuring this directly, okay? Or it's iothalmate. This is super time consuming and it's like really expensive, so it's rarely done. Um, next thing, serum creatinine. Apparently, this, they did this a long time ago. It's not accurate doing it alone. Um, but apparently, if the if there's a doubling of the creatinine, this indicates a halving of the uh, efferent or the EGFR glomerular filtration rate. In other words, um, just think about it. If there's lots of creatinine in your pee, then this isn't filtering very good. Okay, so that's your this is halving. It's, it's filtering whatever. So this, this is good, though, because it predicts the progression of chronic kidney disease. So if you want to know like how bad their chronic kidney disease is, you can look at their creatinine, serum creatinine. And if it's really high, if there's a doubling of it, then you're thinking, oh, there's a halving of their GFR. Cockcroft-Galt equation. Uh, basically, they like took a bunch of numbers, and they estimated clearance from the serum creatinine with the age, gender, and weight. Uh, this was pretty much replaced by the modification of diet and renal disease, MDRD, um, which directly measured the iothalamate with creatinine and other factors. This also wasn't very accurate. And I think that the CKD EPI calculator basically even replaced that one. So this is like old, really old. This was old, and this is like the new one. And this is a little bit more precise. Um, and then also you can do the cystatin C levels. This is more accurate, but it's like super expensive. You only use it in patients in stage 3A CKD, which stands for chronic kidney disease, uh, for further risk stratification if no other markers of injury are present. So if the person has no other markers of injury and you're really trying to figure out like this, the, how bad it is, you can use this. Okay, next. So after you get your results of the, uh, about azotemia, which were these tests up here we just talked about, you get those results back and you're like, oh my goodness, their, their 
EGFR, glomerular filtration rate, is less than expected. So it's like less than 60 milliliters per minute per 1.73 meters squared, whatever. So it's like low. Then you're like, okay, we got to figure out the, the time frame on this thing. Is it chronic or is it acute? So if, if you look at um, these things here, uh, this is indicative of chronic. So chronics, you're, you're going to think it's chronic if there's low red blood counts. So you can check the person's blood, and there's not very much red blood cells. Also, if they have low serum calcium levels, why would this be low? Why would this be low? Probably, probably they peed it out. Okay, they've been peeing out all their blood. Why is their calcium low? Well, they've probably been peeing it out. I don't know. I'm guessing they probably peed it out. Uh, high serum phosphate. Why do they have high phosphate? I don't know. Maybe that's what happens to trigger to try to get them to hold on to calcium more. I'm not really sure to be honest with you. And high serum parathyroid hormone. Probably trying to get them to hold on to more calcium too. Uh, I'm really not sure. Trying to increase the calcium in their blood. Um, he didn't really explain this stuff. He just said this is pretty much what he showed. So next, indicative of uh, disease if abnormal. So um, apparently if there is some abnormal problem, you're going to have an abnormal urinalysis, and you're also going to have an abnormal renal ultrasound. You're going to have like increased kidney size or hydronephrosis. Uh, I think that has to do with like the obstruction thing. Okay, next here. So... Um, Renal failure, acute azotemia. So this is basically now you're thinking, all right, uh, your kidney's got problems. So typically decreased renal perfusion in 40 to 80% of the time. So this is termed pre-renal azotemia. So remember I was talking about the pre-renal, first post-renal, and then intrarenal. So in this case, now the person has azotemia, first of all, you think, okay, it's probably pre-renal. So why is it going to be pre-renal? Pre probably because they have... Decreased cardiac output. If their heart's not pumping very much, it's not going to get to the kidneys. And if it doesn't get to the kidneys, then they're going to have messed up urine stuff. Okay? Or it could be decreased intervascular volume. If they don't have enough blood, they're like dehydrated. Well, if they don't have enough blood, they're going to have messed up kidney issues. Uh, decreased intrinsic autoregulation of the kidney. So basically, the things like your angiotensin converting enzyme or your renin or whatever, these kinds of things are all messed up. Okay? Apparently, NSAIDs can mess this up. Uh, nephritis or messed up prostaglandins. So those things can cause problems. So what are some predictors of acute injury? Well, if the ser if the plasma over serum to BUN over creatinine ratio is messed up, that's like the most common indicator. Or it could be urinary sodium concentration. Uh, that can be messed up as well. Uh, you can just test that, and that'll you know be an indicator of acute injury. Or you can look at the osmola osmolality, and if that's messed up, then that's another indication of acute injury. Or you can look at the fractional excretion of sodium. I don't really know how that differs from sodium concentration, but whatever. Maybe you fractionate it. Not really sure. If that's messed up, that's another indication of acute injury. Next, urinary plasma creatinine ratios. So you look at these. Uh, yeah, you can read. Okay, next, post-renal azotemia. So this is what I was talking earlier. Remember, you've got your kidneys. you got stuff before your kidneys, and you got stuff after your kidneys. Um, the stuff after your kidneys, maybe I'll pull up this thing so I can draw occasionally when I want to. So yeah, so here's your kidneys. We talked about stuff. Before pre-renal, we've talked about that. Now we're talking about post-renal. We're not talking about intra-renal yet. So, um, what just happened? Okay, so uh, now we're talking about post-renal. Usually, this is urinary obstruction. Okay, all you need to do is look at this thing with an ultrasound, and if you see a hydronephrosis, like a, a blockage or whatever, then just put it in a bladder catheter. That'll be fine. Okay, now moving on. Intrarenal azotemia. So this is problems, azotemia from problem with your kidneys. You only think of this after you've ruled out pre and post azotemia. So, azotemia, intrarenal azotemia is also called intrinsic renal disease. So, this is like problems with your glomeruli. So you can detect these by running a urinalysis, which is the subject of this lecture. 
In a urinalysis, you can see things like hematuria, red cell cast, proteinuria. Um, there's two types of proteinuria, apparently. One's called transient. The other one's called persistent. Trans, transient, since they call it orthostatic, this goes away. It's like benign. It's not a big deal. But the persistent is bad. And there's three types of persistent. There is glomerular, tubular, and overflow. Okay? So if it's glomerular persistent type, proteinuria, this is the most common type, you're going to see high levels of albumin. Basically what this means is that your glomerulus is messed up. Okay? Remember the glomerulus is that little... Uh, got like these little like capsule looking things and uh, I kind of didn't do a very good job there. So you got this like tube thing that's all twisted around here and this has got the little cap over it and this is like your little glomerulus, okay? And if this is doing a bad job, then protein's going to be able to leak through. And normally protein doesn't leak through, but if you're doing a bad job, protein's going to leak through and you're going to get all this uh, proteins like albumin and all this albumin is going to go into your pee and that's bad. Now it's called um, persistent glomerular, okay? Next is tubular. So this is a problem with your tubes. Basically, your tubes, um, they're supposed to, uh, see the, the P is supposed to go down here, and then it goes down. I, uh, I didn't draw very good. So here's your glomerulus, and then, you know, it goes down, and then it goes up like this, you know, and you got the thin loop of Henle and whatnot. Okay, so... Uh, first problem was the glomerular, that's the high albumin. Now we're talking about this section here, tubular. If it's tubular, then basically this is like constantly like absorbing things and then like reabsorbing things and stuff's going in and stuff's going out all the time. And if this whole process of, of absorption is, gets messed up, then you're thinking tubular. And this is a malfunctioning tubular, it's not re reabsorbing properly. Next is something called overflow persistent. So basically what's happening in this instance is that you have so many low molecular weight proteins in your blood for whatever reason. So there's just so much protein in here that this gets overflowed and it just goes through here and, you know, comes through here and it ends up coming out in your pee. Okay. All right. Next. Um... Sometimes pyuria. Pyuria, remember, that's white blood cells in your pee. Okay, so now we're talking a little bit about your albumin-creatinine ratio. So this apparently is the best indicator of intrarenal problems. Um, you got to do this. It's got to be your first pee of the morning. Okay, you can't have like can't be your second or third pee. It's got to be your first pee of the morning. And there are actually a lot of confounders. I thought I could spell, but apparently not. Confounders. There we go. Um, your analysis uh, may not work, so sometimes you'll do this your analysis. It doesn't work, and if it doesn't work, it's probably because of anuria, which means you're like not peeing, so that's less or just less than 100 milliliters per day. And maybe that's important to know that anuria is less than 100 milliliters per day. That's not very much pee. That's like no pee at all. People are supposed to pee a lot more than that. Um, sometimes it be, can be because of polyuria. In other words, they maybe they drink tons and tons and tons of water, and they pee so much that their pee is coming out basically like water, and that can mess up some of their results. I'm not really sure how that works, but that's what I'm assuming. Next, the albumin-creatinine ratio. So talking a little bit more about that. So this is looking at your pee over 24 hours, and depending on this ratio is going to determine what kind of medicine you give this person. Okay, So this is really important. This is a big de deal, your albumin-creatinine ratio. So if it's moderately increased, uh, albuminuria, or microalbuminuria, this is between 30 to 299 milligrams per day in 24-hour urine, okay? So that's that, whatever that is, albumin in there. If it's severely increased, this is going to be albuminuria, albuminuria uh, also known as macroalbuminuria. So we had micro, now we got macro, and this is between 300 to 1,000, and... Um, yeah, that's bad. Okay. Now this is really, and they said sometimes it's 3,500 kind of depends, but yeah, then you've got the nephrotic range. So ne nephrotic, that's like death. Okay. You basically this, your kidney's dead and that's more than 3,000 or more than 3,500. They were saying that. So uh, check, know those numbers.
Okay, next, target blood pressures for people in different albumin creatinine ratios. So if a person has, it, like if they're in the severe or the moderate or the nephrotic, then you, then you have different target blood pressures. So the only one he really brought up here was that in people with severe increased, their blood pressure should be like less than 140 over 90. I guess it's because if it's any higher than that, then they can have really serious problems. This is in patients with proteinuria greater than one gram per day. Okay, so gram, milligram, so that must be like a thousand milligrams, one gram per day. Okay, I'm not very good at converting that, even though it's really simple. I don't like numbers. Okay, so uh, if they're losing too much protein in their urine, this can cause, what can this cause? Well, edema, and we understand why it causes edema, right? That's not what I wanted to do. We understand it causes edema because if this is their blood vessel, whoa, this is their blood vessel, here's their leg, they've got these proteins in here. These proteins have a charge on them, and that charge attracts water to go into their blood vessel, which makes them have lots of blood in their blood vessel. But if these little proteins are missing and they're not in there, so the proteins are not there, then there's no real push for this water to go this way. Instead, there'll be more of a push for the water to go this way. And if the water goes this way, and it leaves the, bl the blood vessel, and it goes into this area, then all this water is going to collect in here, and it's going to swell this way out, and the person's going to get edema, especially in their feet, because that's, you know, gravity. Um, okay, so edema, that makes sense. Activation of the renin angiotensin system. Why? Why is that getting activated? Well, if they're losing all their fluid because it's going out of their body following the, um, the proteins, then their, their body is going to freak out and want to hold on to more. And so it's going to, you know, do all the stuff that makes you hold on to fluid, okay, which is uh, trying to increase their blood pressure. Um, sympathetic system also is going to get triggered as it does when you have, you know, low blood pressure. It's trying to, it's trying to get more uh, blood to go to places like your brain and stuff. So it squeezes down, you know, the, you know, the process, um, anti-diuretic hormone system. So, uh, diuresis means peeing. So this is the anti-peeing. So in other words, it's going to release things like aldosterone. Um, and then the aldosterone is going to basically hold on to salt. And if it holds on to salt, then it holds on to pee. And if it holds on to pee, then you're not going to pee as much. So if you're losing too much protein in your pee, then your body's going to try to find other ways to hold on to the, to the fluid. Also, there's going to be increased risk of thromboembolism. Well, this makes sense. If you think about it, if you're losing all your, your fluid and your proteins and whatnot, then your, your pee is going to get really, really uh, concentrated with red blood cells. If it gets really concentrated with red blood cells, it's going to become very viscous. And if it's very viscous, it's really likely for it to get clogged in places because it's got a lot more um, you know, resistance or whatnot. And if it, so if it gets clogged in there, yeah, higher risk of thromboembolism. Also, you're going to lose your lipoproteins. I don't know why, but apparently you do. Uh, next, increased hepatic synthesis of lipoproteins. Um, this is something that actually happens because of the loss of lipoproteins. So basically, um, you lose all these lipoproteins in your pee, and then your body's like, ah, I lost all my lipoproteins. So it makes a whole bunch of lipoproteins, and it makes so many that you end up getting hypercholesterolemia. Okay, So if a person has hypercholesterolemia, that can happen because... They're losing too many proteins in their urine. Okay, so now we talked about protein in the urine. Now we're talking about hematuria, uh, blood in the urine. This is greater than two to five red blood cells per high power field on micro exam. In other words, you do a, a micro exam, you spin it, you look at it, you see two to five red blood cells. Doesn't seem like very many. I'm like wondering if I did this right, but I think I did. Um, you can also detect it by a dipstick test, but sometimes the dipstick test will, will give you a false positive. If the person has myoglobinuria, um, this basically means they have rhabdomyolysis of, or muscle destruction. If they have muscle destruction, then you're going to get a negative dipstick test. And it'll say you have hematuria when, like, apparently you don't. Instead, you have this. Um, so when hematuria occurs without proteinuria or uh, other uh, cell cells or casts, so basically you have red blood cells, but you don't have any failure of the basement, basement membrane or, and, or you don't have any red blood cell casts, as we talked about earlier, then you're thinking, 
hmm, this isn't a problem with the kidneys. This is a problem in the urinary tract. Maybe there's like an infection or something in the urinary tract. Maybe it's a tumor or something in their urinary tract. Something else. Probably not because there's no problems with the protein retention and probably because there's no problems with red blood cell casts in the glomeruli. They're thinking down below the kidneys. So this can happen from like renal stones, trauma, prostatitis. Unless you're a woman, that's not likely to be the problem for women. Um, if you like see literally red pee, someone's like peeing out red pee, um, then you're thinking, well, this must be like below the ureter, uh, like lice, because the, the lysis of the red blood cells is common in dilute urine. So if the person has really dilute urine, those red blood cells are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger until they just burst open. So you're not normally going to see actual red pee. This is only like a vis visible microscopically. So if you're actually seeing red pee, it must be really close to the opening of where the pee is coming out. Uh, microscopic hematuria. So this is like what you see, like the red blood cells in there. Really wide diagnosis for this. Could be a lot of different things. Um, wide differential diagnosis, excuse me. So first of all, persistent means that there's less than three episodes. I think it's supposed to be more than three episodes, but whatever. Or greater than 100 red blood cells. I'm not really sure. I need to look that up. Um, yep, urological pathology, 90% of the time. Isolated, um, often with dysmorphic red blood cells. So basically, like, dysmorphic red blood cells means the red blood cells are, like, all smashed and weird looking. And that's because they've been smashed in the kidneys, um, those little tubes and things. So then you get this red blood cell cast. We already talked about that earlier. Talked about this as well. So if you see a red blood cell cast and the person has protein excretion, of greater than 500 milligrams per day, glomerulonephritis. It's like pathognomonic. You know that's what it is. If the person has pyuria, which is, again, again white, red, white blood cells in the pee, you're thinking bacteria or maybe a bladder infection, and a bladder infection. If there's less than 250 um, of that, then you're thinking primary polydipsia. Greater than 300 in the urine, uh, per liter, you're thinking solute diuresis. So some little notes about collecting the pee. First of all, apparently women don't really, you always think, oh, women need to wipe before they collect their pee because it might, you know, their pee might collect something and get contaminated. But apparently they did a study on this and women don't really need to wipe before they pee. It doesn't make any difference apparently. It's not significant at all. So, but you do need to make sure that you do your examination really quickly after you pee, like within two hours, because when the pee sits there, it like changes over time, and it's not going to be accurate if it sits for too long. Some more notes about the dipstick urinalysis. Just know it's cheap, simple, convenient, uh, checks the specific gravity. Um, 1.01 .01 or isothenuric, I don't remember why I wrote that. So pH is important for urea splitting organisms. We talked about that already. Um, I think everything else really important. We talked about all these things already. Talked about that. Talked about that. Um, talked about that. Uh, oh, one thing I didn't mention: ketone urea can also be pregnancy as well. Uh, we talked about that. And I think we are done. Yep, that's it. There's some charts here. Um, and be aware of this stuff. Squamous epithelial cells. I think that's maybe it's cancer or something. I'm not sure. Uh, convoluted renal tubule cells. That's what they look like. Okay, these different types of, of casts. So I mentioned earlier, remember, we, should, we saw those different types of casts. This is what they, they, they indicate here. So a highland cast, remember I showed the picture of the highland cast earlier? Here it is again, right here. There's a highland cast. So see that highland cast? What are you thinking? You are thinking uh, mucoproteins, made of mucoproteins, pyelonephritis, chronic renal disease, maybe a normal finding. If they've got red blood cell cast, you're thinking glomerulonephritis, Glomerulonephritis may be a normal finding in patients who play contact sports. Could be from like trauma. You see white blood cell cast, you're thinking pyelonephritis. Okay, red blood cells was glomerulonephritis. White blood cells is pyelonephritis. Glomerular red blood cells, 
pilo white blood cells. Maybe what you can think is uh, a white pie. I don't know what you can think. Good luck. Um, could also be glomerular nephritis, interstitial nephritis, renal inflammatory processes. Uh, if you see epithelial cells, so like those squamous cells you saw earlier, or renal tubule cells, that's there's a squamous. Here's the renal tubule cells, but here's this. So if you see that, what are you thinking? You're thinking acute tubular necrosis, interstitial nephritis, eclampsia, ooh, nephrotic syndrome, allograft rejection, uh-oh, heavy metal ingestion, or renal disease. If you see granular stuff, then you're thinking advanced renal disease. I think there was a granular one on here. There it is. There's granular. See something like that? What are you thinking? Advanced renal disease. Well, why? Why do you think that? Because granulation tissue comes out after it's like in the stages of healing and stuff. So it's not so so much acute. Um, if you see waxy stuff, think it also advanced renal disease. If you see fatty stuff, think nephrotic syndrome, renal disease, hypothyroidism. If you see broad, I don't know what that that's supposed to mean. End stage renal disease. Uh oh, that's bad. Okay, I don't even understand what that means. Good luck looking over that. These are some things with the color. Cloudy, what are you thinking? Um, purine rich foods, uh, you know, these things here. Brown, maybe bile pigments. Maybe they had fava beans or something. Um, brownish black, Ugh. bile pigments, melanin, metahemoglobin. That stuff, green or blue. Oh, I remember Pseudomonas has those green or blue pigments. Yep. Um, this stuff, <laughs> orange. You didn't talk about this too much. This one, my covering it. Orange bile pigment pigments. Um, this stuff, <laughs> red hematuria. Yeah, obviously. Maybe they ate some beets or blackberries. Maybe they had uh, rhubarb. Or maybe they're really weird and they ate a whole bunch of red licorice. Just kidding. Uh, yellow, concentrated urine, thinking like carrots. Uh, I didn't know it could change your pee. That's crazy. Uh, this is some causes of false positive and false negative urinalysis tests. Uh, not super highly covered, but you can read over it if you want. Um, accuracy of urinalysis for disease detection. Not really covered much in the document, but you can read over if you want to. Common causes of hematuria. Mm, yeah. Uh, that's not super high yield, I don't think. Common causes of proteinuria. Yeah, I mean, here's some good stuff. Heavy metal ingestion, Fanconi syndrome, uh, sarcoidosis, sickle cell disease. I'm wondering if that, maybe I should have looked at this again. Oh, he, oh, this is what would cause blood in your pee, familial causes of Febreze disease. This is good. This is good stuff. Glomerulin on Fridus. Um, yeah, I mean, be, I would probably read over this once. Probably read over this once, maybe lightly. Uh, this is some good questions to kind of test your knowledge. And, uh, and that's my whole document.